Hey folks, welcome back to another Combo Class bonus channel, Math Lesson with Demotro. Today, I want to show you some cool properties that the number 8 and 9 have in their friendship. And these are not only neighboring numbers, which is what I like to nickname whole positive integers that land on consecutive numbers with a difference of just one, but they're a very special type of neighboring numbers. Now in this episode, I'm only going to be talking about whole positive integers like one, two, three, and so on. No zeros or fractions or negatives are going to be needed here. So when I use the word number in this episode, you can assume I just mean a whole positive number. And when I use the term neighbor, that's my own playful way of saying numbers that land on consecutive integers with a difference of just one. Now, if I want to analyze what makes eight and nine special, you might think it has to do with a lot of the weird divisibility tricks or multiplication tricks that they can do with digits. But those really just emerge from our base 10 system and from this being the number one under our base and this being the number two under our base. And if we were to count in like a base six system, for example, these digits wouldn't even be symbols that would represent numbers. We could reassign them to something else. We would need multiple digits to express these amounts of things. But the number playing the role of B minus one and B minus two would still exist. Five would be like the new nine in that way in certain traits it had and four would be like the new eight in certain traits that that had in terms of B minus one and B minus two in a given base. So in our base 10 system, these get extra superpowers, but we don't even need to refer to the base to think about some of their interesting patterns by just checking out their underlying structure, which is the primes that multiply to make them up. Now, if I wanted to know what uh, whole numbers add up to one of these, that's a much more complicated question having to do with this thing called the partition function. But if I want to know what whole numbers multiply to these, well, I could string along any number of ones times one times one times one, but going for numbers one and upward, anytime I split this, like if I went two times four, if I split that again, I'm going to end up at a point where everything left at the bottom was a prime number. I can split this into two times two times two at its most fundamental level. And we can write that as two to the third power. And with nine, that one could be split into three times three, which makes its fundamental structure in terms of multiplication, but which is incredibly important with these integers, is gonna be three times three or three squared. Now, do you notice how these sort of look like the flip of each other? It's two to the third power and three to the second power, numbers to each other's power. Now, what are the numbers that we raise to each other's power? Two and three. Another set of important neighbor numbers. Two and three also land just one away from each other, and they're very important neighboring numbers because they're the only set of two neighboring numbers that could both be prime. And that's because beyond two, all of the further even numbers aren't going to be able to be prime. And if we look at any two numbers in a row, whether we have an odd first or an even first, one of the two in a row is going to be even. And thus, if it's bigger than two, one of the two is going to be divisible by two and not going to be a prime. So the only time you could have primes right on neighboring numbers is two and three. In fact, primes that are just a little further than that, the next closest possible, which is on two neighboring odd numbers, like five and seven, are known as twin primes. And it's one of the biggest, and in my opinion, most important questions in math that's still not fully solved, whether there's an infinite amount of that type of twin prime that are just on 
two apart on consecutive odd numbers. But we're not going to call those neighbors today because by neighbors we meant super close, just one away from each other like two and three were. And so because all the future evens can't be prime, two and three are the only pair of neighboring primes. And so it's pretty interesting that they're also the numbers that when you raise them to each other's powers, get another set of neighbors. Now, when we look at numbers like this, eight being able to express as just twos and nine able to be expressed as just threes, as opposed to something like say 35, which can be broken into five, times seven, and then those are both primes, so we can't break it any further in its prime factorization, but these are two different primes we're left with. These are a special type, and if we want to be really specific about a type, we could call this a perfect cube, which means some integer raised to the third power as what we can factor or break down the number we're asking about into. And this one right here isn't a perfect cube, but it's what we could call a perfect square, because it's some integer raised to the second power in its representation, when we get down to the most fundamental level. And really with a perfect power, you could say that something like 16 is a perfect power in two ways, because we can call it four to the second power, or we can call it two to the fourth power. So some lists of perfect powers, even double list or triple list or more, certain ones that can be made multiple ways. But really as long as we can take some whole number, raise it to another whole number power that is two or greater, we can call it a perfect power in general. And a perfect power is just a vaguer, bigger term than square or cube is that includes the squares, cubes, and fourth powers and stuff like that. So if we want to look at the perfect powers, we could theoretically include one as a perfect power. And different lists sometimes include that or sometimes don't because it depends whether we require our base number to be two or greater or just require our exponent to be two or greater. Occasionally zero is even considered a perfect power, but we won't consider it one today. Now, whether or not we consider one to be a perfect power, the next smallest goes to four, which is two squared. Then we get our eight and our nine. Now, what comes after that? Well, I could try and go through all the powers of two, or I could try and go through all the squares. So there's kind of a few ways I could try and build it. You know, I could say two cubed, then two to the fourth, then two to the fifth, then two to the sixth. Or I could say three squared, then four squared, then five squared, then six squared. Or I could try and make them both at once by making a little table that's kind of like the exponentiation version of what a times table does with multiplication. And if you've seen my other recent video, remember, times tables shouldn't be designed to be memorized. I mean, maybe small stretches of them are good to memorize, but the goal shouldn't be to memorize all your 13 times sevens or whatever. The goal should be to know some cool patterns that can live in times tables. And when we make one of those, we could basically take one number on either axis and multiply it by another number on the other axis. And that would give us a lot of symmetry for the typical times table because like my two times five would be the same as my two times five and stuff. And the diagonal would have some interesting traits that I pointed out in that other video. But what about if instead of making each axis multiply to the other, I have it matter which axis I'm talking about first. I call this one my A axis, this one's my B, and I say what's in the box is going to be A to the power of B. So now it matters which order I look at it, it's not going to have the same exact symmetry around a diagonal axis because B to the A isn't always the same as A to the B if A and B are certain given numbers, like three to the fifth is not the same as five to the third. Now, if I filled in this chart infinitely, 
first, if I want to start with A being 1, then no matter what power I put this up to, I'm still getting a bunch of 1s. So some of these terms could be double counted, kind of like I said that 16 could be double counted as 2 to the 4 or 4 to the 2. We can put that in right now since we've already pointed it out. 4 to the 2 gets us 16, and 2 to the 4 also gets us 16. Um, and remember that this is not always true, that you can flip them like that. It just happens to be the case there. 2 to the 4 and 4 to the 2 got lucky. <laughs> now, so that's a spot where it looks like we might almost have the same symmetry in the other chart but as we used to, but we don't. Now, going down here, I'm going to get the natural numbers because it's everything to the first power. But what if I say I just want to be left with the ones we would call perfect powers? Well, then I'm going to trim off this row because that one's too trivial to the first power. We're not going to consider it a perfect power. Now, we could also trim off that row if we needed to get one out of here to simplify things, but I'll let one be a perfect power today. And like I said, it does differ. There are different conventions for when one is considered a perfect power or not. But today, one shall get to join the ranks. Zero will not. So let's fill in a few more things here. Two to the second power gets four. Then we get our eight, 16, 32. And those are our powers of 2 going up. How about 3? Starting with 3 squared, there's our 9. And then we get 3 cubed, 27, 81. And then we get 243. Now next, we get 4. That gave us the 16 already. 4 cubed gave us 64. And then I'm going to stop filling them in there for a second. Now 5 squared gets us 25. 5 cubed gets us 125, and once again, we cannot need to worry about the huge ones. Now, if I did continue this indefinitely, I would get all of my perfect powers. Just like in the last chart, we were told things about composite numbers versus prime numbers. Now we're getting a different sort of pa pattern. Numbers that are the bigger family that squares and cubes live in. Any sort of perfect power which seems like you'd want it to feel symmetric because you can go two to the fifth power or five to the second power, but they're rarely going to be the same. Only two to the fourth and four to the second happen to get that lucky here. Now, what do we notice about these numbers? Well, they're a lot more spread apart than some of the other charts we've made in the past. Like, we have eight and nine. Now, not only are they kind of still neighbors with each other here, um, even in this diagram, and that's because they came from neighboring numbers raised to each other's powers. But they also, and which does also make them lie right on the edge of the diagonal. Like if I put a dotted line through the diagonal, they lie right on the edge because they're neighbors being taken to each other's powers. But they're the only neighboring or consecutive numbers at all we can see on this part of the chart. Like, not even caring about where they land, there's no 17s or 15s visible, no 31s or 33s visible. So if I extended this chart long enough, we might expect that I might find another time that two might land close together. We could deduce that 15 or 17 would be impossible to be a perfect power like this. But what if we had some massive thing? Who's to say that, like, 777 to the fifth power isn't one away from like 351 to the seventh power. Now, those might actually be pretty off in size. It's kind of hard to gauge these things. But who's to say that there's not two weird random numbers out there that are going to land exactly one apart on neighbors like eight and nine did? Well, that was a question that's probably been wondered by mathematicians for many, many years, and the first documentation of it being formally expressed as a conjecture um, was in the 1800s, I think around the 1840s, and it was believed when more numbers were investigated with that conjecture that perhaps eight and nine somehow were the only perfect powers 
not only the only square and cube, but the only perfect powers of any sort that lay on neighboring numbers. And after many, many years throughout the 1800s and 1900s, no counterexamples were found, but it wasn't proven yet. And then in 2002, a mathematician finally proved it. So in 2002, it was officially confirmed that eight and nine, similar to how two and three are the only primes that land on neighbors, eight and nine have been confirmed to be the only perfect powers that land on neighbors. And to me, it's very interesting that they're cooked up from the neighboring primes raised to each other's powers. <laughs> For one, that story shows how sometimes it takes an insane amount of time to prove a question that's so simple that you might first think you'd get it and then think you'll never get it, and then someday someone gets it. So it's always worth continuing to try new ways of interpreting problems and trying to cap crack age-old simple questions like neighboring perfect powers. And it also goes to show that eight and nine and two and three are very special types of neighboring number. So I'm sure we'll bump into eights, nines, twos, and threes a lot more in the future. They are magnificent integers. Thank you for popping by this little combo class bonus lesson to learn this stuff with me. Make sure you've also checked out the new full-length episode on the main channel I put out last night, because that one all about the strange hyper shape sequences, as I call them, has some insane math, some insane scenes, and it's the longest and probably craziest combo class episode yet on the main channel. So make sure you've checked that out, and I'll catch you again soon to learn some more cool numerical things. Have a great day.